All right, in this video, we're going to go over something called the Westergaard solution. We'll get a start on it, give some basic, basic mathematics. Basically, the, the Westergaard solution for crack tip stress fields uses something called an airy stress function. So in uh, a course in theory of elasticity, we can learn that we can apply a potential function technique to determine stress fields in uh, two-dimensional elastic bodies. Uh, this uh, only works for 2D bodies, and this approach is called Aries stress function. And in uh, AEM 637, the class that I teach, we use the technique to find stress fields uh, near a hole in a plate. All right. So in that class, we have a, a flat plate and plane stress, and we've got a hole in it. And we apply some remote stress, and then we learn that if we look at the stress along this line that, that goes uh, horizontally, that the stress would kind of go like that, uh, where this would be the stress in the vertical direction, the y direction, and that would be the distance x along that line. And not only can we get the stress component in the y direction, but we can get all the stress components, sigma x, sigma y, and tau xy. And we can plot a von Mises stress contour and do other interesting things to look at the stress fields around the tip of a crack. One of the things that we learn is that uh, for a plate with a hole, the stress concentration factor is 3, where it's defined as your maximum stress in the y direction divided by your nominal or your remote applied stress. With a, a different type of airy stress function, we can investigate the crack tip stress fields for an elastic two-dimensional body. So basically we're going to take the same thin plate and we're going to apply a uh, the same nominal stress. And we'll have this in the end. Uh, but the um, instead of that hole there, we're going to have a crack. So this is a very sharp uh, zero radius point here at the crack tip. So just to write this down, I'll say here a, a similar approach can be used for a plate with a crack. The, the notable difference is that instead of a function of real numbers, our area stress function is going to be a complex potential function. So because of this, and in the likelihood that you haven't had uh, a lot of background in complex functions and complex numbers, we need to give a little bit of background in the mathematics of complex numbers and complex functions so that we can get into this potential function technique. All right, so that's what we'll do in uh, part one of this video. All right. So a complex number is a number that's composed of real and imaginary parts. So the complex number little z that I have there, little z is equal to x plus i y. And we would say that the real part of z is the number x. And the imaginary part of z is the number y. And here what we're talking about with i is uh, the square root of minus 1. And you're probably uh, familiar with that. So any complex number can be written in this form. Now, even though we say the imaginary part of z is equal to y, y is actually a real number itself. It's the i that makes it the imaginary part of that complex number. So every complex number can be represented by a point in what's called the complex plane. So 
It's kind of like a vector diagram. Get my axis straightened out here a little bit. <clears throat> so along the horizontal axis, we can think of that as our usual x-axis, and, and this vertical axis, the y-axis. And so we have some particular point over here. That's uh, point Z. And point Z is equal to x plus i, y. Now, if we talk of complex functions, a complex function can be written as a function of a complex number z, which itself can be broken up into two functions, a function u of x and y, which is purely the real part. So we would say the real part of the function f of z is equal to u of x and y. And then v of x and y, which is the imaginary part of that function f of z. And that part has the i multiplied by it. So f of z is equal to u of x and y plus i v of x and y. Now, uh, as part of what we need to do for every stress functions of complex potential functions, we need to take derivatives of complex functions. So we need to look in a little bit more detail about uh, derivatives. So let me write this down just to have it. And if we go all the way back to the definition of a derivative, we can say the derivative of that function f of z, or f prime of z, would be a limit as a small increment goes to zero of delta z of the function evaluated at some initial point plus that increment minus the function evaluated at that initial point divided by uh, that increment again as that increment goes to zero. Now here our z naught is equal to an x naught plus i y naught so it's a complex number and our delta z is equal to a delta x plus i delta y. So we have increments in both delta x and in delta y. Let me start with a clean page for this next bit. We're going to take a look at the real part and the imaginary part of the derivative. All right. <clears throat> so the real part of the derivative is going to be equal to the limit as the pair delta x delta y goes to zero zero those individual increments and then we would write this the real part of f of z plus delta z minus f of z over delta z or z naught in this case so i have uh, we'll try to keep that consistent notation in a similar way if we want the imaginary part of the derivative would be the limit is that pair delta x and delta y goes to zero zero
of the imaginary part based on the definition of the derivative. So f of z naught plus delta z minus f of z naught divided by delta z. Okay, so the stuff in the square brackets is the derivative, and we're just writing this in a little bit different way. <clears throat> now, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to look more at these terms in the brackets. So this f of z naught plus delta z minus f of z naught uh, divided by delta z can be written in terms of our u and v functions. So this would be equivalent to writing it this way. u of x naught plus delta x and y naught plus delta y. Remember, it's a function of both x and y. Minus u of x naught and y naught. over delta x plus i delta y. Okay, that's delta z down on the bottom. So that first part that I've written here is the real function part. And then we have the imaginary part, which is the part with the i, and the function v. So we have v of x naught plus delta x y naught plus delta y minus v of x naught and y naught and then on the bottom delta x plus i delta y Okay, if we look at the complex plane, as far as increments go, here we have 0 for x, and we're changing our delta y. Here we have 0 for y, and we're changing our delta x. Okay, so this axis would be the delta x term, and this axis would be the delta y term. And what we're doing is we're taking both of those, and we're approaching 0, 0 for that delta term. So let's be explicit. Here's the complex plane for increments. And we want to try to get to this point right here. All right. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to approach that 0, 0 increment from the direction along the x-axis where delta x goes to 0 with delta y being equal to 0. Let me bring this page over that I had previously. So we're approaching along this horizontal axis to get to this point. And so with delta y being equal to 0, we can simplify these terms. We're going to make this term 0, this delta y right here, and uh, this delta y right here. And, of course, on the bottom, the delta y will go away. Um, that should be, plus, uh, should be a plus sign and not a t. Uh, the delta y will go away, and we'll be able to simplify that expression a little bit. So let's do that. Let's write that down. the real part of the derivative then will be the limit as delta x goes to zero because the delta y is equal to zero of u 
of delta uh, u, u of x naught plus delta x minus u of x naught and y naught divided by delta x. Uh, I'm going to leave a little space there for a moment. In the imaginary part of the derivative, be the limit as delta x goes to zero of v of x naught plus delta x and y naught. Actually, I left off a term up here, so let me fix that. x naught plus delta x comma y naught. minus v of x naught and y naught divided by delta x. Now, what these limits are, since this is a, a function u and a function v, that are functions of two variables, but we're only effectively taking the limit with respect to one of the variables, what we have is a definition of a partial derivative. So this first term would be the partial derivative of u with respect to x. And this one is the partial derivative of v with respect to x. Okay, So what does that say? It says the real part of the derivative is the partial of u with respect to x. The imaginary part of the derivative is the partial derivative function v with respect to x. So in other words, f prime of z naught is equal to <clears throat> partial derivative of u with respect to x plus i partial derivative of v with respect to x. Okay. Now, we're going to do the other way now. We're going to take delta x equal to zero. We're going to let delta y approach zero. We're going to go down the other coordinate axis. Again, let me flip this up so we can take a look. We're going to take this delta y and approach zero while delta x is equal to zero. And we're going to arrive at the zero, zero point that way. So let's write a couple notes here. Okay, and if we do that, then we'll have the real part of the derivative will be the limit as delta y goes to zero of v of x naught y naught plus delta y minus v of x naught and y naught over delta y. Now the reason why it's v in this case is because when delta x goes to zero, the delta x term disappears on the bottom, but we still have i plus delta y on the bottom. And so the i that's multiplied by the v terms and the i on the bottom cancel each other out. So the real part of the derivative then would be the partial derivative of v with respect to y. And then the imaginary part 
or the derivative will be the limit as delta y goes to zero with delta x being equal to zero we would have an i squared which would give us a minus one out in front u of x naught and y naught plus delta y minus u of x naught and y naught and on the bottom we have the delta y so this is equal to minus partial derivative of u with respect to y Now you may want to verify the algebra that this is indeed the case, but if you do that, uh, it will work out. If we have a smooth and continuous function with continuous derivatives, it shouldn't matter which approach we took to get to the point zero zero for our increments. All right, so what that means is the partial derivative of u with respect to x is going to be equal to the partial derivative of v with respect to y for those complex functions that satisfy the continuity con uh, conditions imposed on it. And the partial derivative of v with respect to x that we had on the previous page is equal to minus the partial derivative of u with respect to y. So another way to write this, and I'll write this on the next page, and that's that the real part of the derivative is equal to the partial derivative of the real part of the function with respect to x, or the partial derivative of the imaginary part of the original function with respect to y. And the imaginary part of the derivative is the partial derivative of the imaginary part of the function with respect to x which is also equal to the negative of the partial derivative of the real part of the original function with respect to y. These are known as the cauchy riemann uh, relations. And in the future, I'll probably just abbreviate these as the CR equations. Now that we've done some first derivatives, let's take a look at some second derivatives. All right, so just as uh, to keep it up here, let's write this in the corner so we keep things straight. 
So if we take this first equation, and um, since those are equal, if we take the second derivative of u with respect to x, that's the same as taking the second partial of v with respect to x and y. I'm going to label this as equation 1. We can take the mixed partial derivative of u with respect to x and y, and then that would be the same as the second partial derivative of v with respect to y twice. We can use this other set of equations here, and we can take the second partial of v with respect to x twice, and that would be equal to minus the second partial of u with respect to x and y. Label that as number 3. And then the second partial derivative of v with respect to x and y is going to give us negative second partial of u with respect to y twice. And I'll label that as equation 4. Now let's take a look at equation 1 and equation 4. The right-hand term here is the same as the left-hand term over there. So we can have that uh, the second partial of u with respect to x twice is equal to the negative second partial of u with respect to y twice, or we can write it this way, putting all the terms on the left-hand side, second partial of u with respect to x plus second partial of v with respect to y is equal to zero. From 2 and 4, all right, here we have uh, the right-hand side is the second partial of v with respect to y, and the left-hand side is the second partial of u with respect to x and y. If we take this negative sign and move it over here, then that's the same thing as saying the second partial of v with respect to y twice is equal to the negative of the second partial of v with respect to x twice. Or if we write this uh, again with all the terms on the left-hand side, we have the second partial of v with respect to uh, x twice plus the second partial of v with respect to y twice equal to zero. Now, a compact way to write this is with our del squared operator. So this is del squared u equal to zero, and this is uh, del squared v equal to zero. Now here, del squared is the Laplacian operator. You can get that through the gradient, doing a dot product in two dimensions of the gradient vector with itself, gradient operator. Uh, but we can think of this as a, a function of partial derivatives where if we have this as u, u would go in this position. If we have this operating on v, then v would go in this position. Now since u is the real part of the function, we can write this another way. We can say that del squared, the real part 
of the function f of z is equal to 0, we're down here. We can say, since v is the imaginary part of the original function, we can see, say, del squared, the imaginary part of the function f is equal to 0. So all these things are equivalent. Okay. All right, so to write this on this page, we have del squared, the real part of the function, equal to 0. We have del squared, the imaginary part of the function, is equal to 0. If del squared operating on the real and the imaginary part of the function is equal to 0, then that implies that del squared of the function is equal to 0. Now, if del squared of some function is known to equal to 0, then del fourth of that function will also equal to 0. And it's the del fourth that we're going to be using when we get into our area stress functions. All right, so any function that we know satisfies the cauchy riemann relations automatically satisfies what's known as the biharmonic equation. This del fourth f equal to zero is called the biharmonic equation. And in theory of elasticity, what we learn is that any function that satisfies a biharmonic equation has to be two-dimensional functions, satisfies some elasticity problem in plane stress or plane strain, some plane elasticity problem. Now, there are an infinite number of functions that can satisfy this biharmonic equation. The trick with Aries stress function is to be able to figure out which problem you have solved with any particular function that satisfies the biharmonic equation. Uh, and that is where great insight uh, comes into play. So, in the next part, we're going to review a little bit about plane elasticity, and then uh, we'll get into the Westergaard function in, I think, the third part of this video series.